I'd like to uh, welcome you to this virtual lunch. I'll be spending the next half hour or so with you. And uh, the topic, as you can see from the slide, is uh, can psychotherapy research and practice survive our doc? So for the past 60 years or so, the uh, NIMH has been funding psychotherapy research. Within the past years, unfortunately, there's been a, a dramatic shift. And the shift has been to place clinical trials and other forms of psychotherapy research, uh, particularly treating DSM disorders, to, to place these as a very low priority. And that the high priority that exists now is for basic translational research, especially translating the biological um, the RDOC variables or domains, which we will get into in a little while, to, to try to uncover these um, neurological and genetic correlates of various psychological processes that may be contributing to psychological disorders. So the questions are, why has this happened? Uh, and what are the implications of this? So the purpose of my talk, this virtual lunch, is threefold. One is to fully understand why this has happened. And in order to do so, I would like to place the RDOC priorities in a historical context, uh, in a context of uh, economics, and in a context of the politics that may be involved. Also, I'd like to comment on the implications that the RDOC priority has for clinical psychology, not only research in clinical psychology, but uh, training programs, about which I do have some very grave concerns. And then finally, perhaps a little bit more happily, uh, I would like to let you know about some very recent developments, which hopefully um, could provide a ray of optimism uh, for research on psychotherapy. So to begin, let's look at the history of NIMH funding over the years. And to understand it, uh, we can place it in three generations. Uh, in 1950, the Annual Review of Psychology published an article on the status of psychotherapy research. It occupied 14 pages, including references. So there was not very much, if any, research, and certainly not decent research, on psychotherapy. Uh, Hans Eysenck, a um, British psychologist, published a key article in 1952 in which he decried the fact that many people are practicing psychotherapy, but with no empirical evidence whatsoever. It's mostly on the therapist's say-so. So in the 1950s and also moving into the 60s, the NIMH started to fund psychotherapy research. And this was the first generation. And the question that was asked was a very general question, namely, does psychotherapy work? Um, not only was it a general question, but the methodology that was used was pretty weak. Um, and it was criticized by many people, and certainly uh, Kiesler uh, criticized this research, calling it the uniformity myth. Uh, the uniformity myth referring to the fact that not all psychotherapies are the same. And uh, what works depends on various aspects and various things that are much more specific. So it was far too general a question to address by any kind of research, um, or at least to come up with any decent answers. So we then transitioned to generation two. Generation one was helpful in the sense that it, it raised the issue, the need for empiricism. Generation two um, promised a great deal more, and it was really quite a leap from generation one. 
It was fostered mainly by behavior therapists. And this was in the 1960s and 1970s. And behavior therapy came onto the scene with a very different and, and kind of a fascinating, at least to my mind, uh, premise. Namely, that instead of figuring out what works therapeutically based purely on clinical observation, let's look at basic science. Let's look at basic research on psychological processes from the laboratory. And then we'll go, we will extrapolate from the lab to the clinic. And at the time, most of the research in the lab consisted of learning and conditioning classical conditioning, operant conditioning. Uh, and it was a major shift to have the notion that we are going to extrapolate from laboratory findings to clinical application. Not only that, <clears throat> the methodology in the research was far improved. And many of the people who did the research, since they were extrapolating from basic research findings, knew something about research methodology. So our outcome studies involved random assignment of participants to different conditions, controlling for the number of sessions, uh, using multi-method assessment procedures, and even the development of manuals, which goes back to the late 60s. Another interesting component of this second generation was that the focus was on what was called target behaviors. These were specific characteristics and problems that individuals had. Um, specific phobias, lack of assertiveness, procrastination, anxiety in public speaking situations, in test taking situations, and the like. Also during uh, generation two, the NIMH funded process research uh, outcome research was, does the therapy work? And process research addressed the question, uh, what are the mechanisms? How does it work? And the NIMH uh, at the time generously funded such research. And um, I must acknowledge full disclosure that, um, that I was a recipient of funding for several decades. Um, and it was on behavior therapy and then on process research. And the NIMH then, in addition to funding behavior therapy and, and CBT research, also started to fund research on psychodynamic interventions. And this went on until the 1980s. In the 1980s, we began what we can think of as generation three. And it represented a sea change at the NIMH. The nature of the change was it became much more medical in its thinking about psychological problems. They became disorders. And DSM became very, very important in understanding the different types of disorders that needed to be treated. And this clearly reflected uh, the increasing dominance by psychiatry within the NIMH. This shift in the NIMH paralleled what was going on in the field of psychiatry itself over the 70s and 80s. Namely, it moved from psychosocial intervention to biological psychiatry. So medical school psychiatry departments underwent a radical shift. Um, they had been doing mostly training in psychodynamic therapy, although they did in the 80s uh, work and training on uh, CBT did come to uh, become more popular. But there was very, very little research to back up what they were teaching. And the prestige of psychiatry departments plummeted. Uh, there was a lot of speculation particularly in the 70s with a psychodynamic approach. Uh, there was very little, if any, grant funding. And residents tended to shy away from psychiatry as a specialization. So this is part of the history of the shift in the uh, departments of psychiatry, which also 
uh, drove the shift in the NIMH. And during generation three, what happened is that the medical model to drug development was used as the model for psycho, psychosocial research for clinical disorders. So instead of outcome research, um, NIMH funded clinical trials. Uh, instead of target behaviors from generation two, uh, it was replaced by DSM diagnoses. Uh, the functional analysis or um, the notion of looking at the dynamics of change that was present in generation two shifted. So if somebody came in with more than one psychological problem, the relationship between one and the other was not looked at, but rather they had two disorders. So we began to think of it as comorbidity. And the notion that a person could be depressed because they are not functioning adequately and they may not be functioning adequately because of anxiety. So instead of the link between the two, they had two disorders. It's clear that generation three not only changed the kind of research that was done, but also how we began to think about clinical problems. They were categorical disorders, not problems in living. They were labels, not variables. I'll tell you an interesting little backstory uh, that vividly illustrates this shift in thinking. I participated in an NIMH-sponsored uh, weekend workshop to develop uh, outcome me measures for clinical trials. And I was in the group that was looking at measures for anxiety disorders. There was a small group of us there, and we were debating what the measures should focus on. And there were two clinical researchers, both of them psychodynamic in their origin, and they were arguing that the outcome measure should really consist primarily, if not only, of reduction in symptomatology. And I was arguing at the time that, yes, this is clearly crucial, but we should also look at other variables that might be related to this reduction uh, in anxiety, such mediators as um, uh, procrastination or self-criticism. And their response was very interesting. They said, no, we don't want to see these at all because this is not what is funded by the NIMH. And I had a deja vu during this interaction because I had had arguments with psychodynamic therapists uh, very much like this in the 1970s, except the roles were reversed. I was arguing that behavior therapy could change the symptomatology and the psychodynamic colleagues were saying, no, it's not just the symptomatology. We also have to look at the underlying mechanisms. So clearly, uh, funding in research from the NIMH with this more biological, this more medical emphasis has changed how we think about psychological problems. Uh, it should also be noted that during this uh, generation, uh, process research was virtually eliminated. Uh, eliminated. We were not really interested uh, in that. So I was being funded by the NIMH and Barry Wolf was the staff member who was responsible for my research which focused on anxiety. And he visited with me on a site visit uh, prior to a renewal that I was going to uh, send in. And he said, basically, Marv, um, we're not going to fund your research anymore uh, on studying these target behaviors. Um, we need to use real clinical problems with real people, real patients. Uh, and uh, this reflected the major shift. A few years later, I might add that Barry Wolf and I uh, published an article in the uh, American psychologist in 1996 criticizing this shift. Uh, Barry had been with the NIMH for 22 years and we wrote this article uh, after his retirement. We discussed the problematic natures of DSM, uh, that it's descriptive, that it's not ideological, that it is too global and too heterogeneous, uh, 
uh, and that there is no functional analysis which is related to the all-important need for case formulation. Uh, and we said this is not how clinicians work. Uh, so it is not speak the results from these clinical trials are really not speaking to what the clinicians need to know. Um, a side effect of generation three was that there was this requirement that, that clinical manuals needed uh, to be submitted with one's application. And what has happened is that many beginning therapists are learning to do therapy on the basis of these manuals. Uh, and there are pros and cons associated with it, but it provides an overly sim simplified method of uh, how people change without really having a background necessarily, if you just, just use the manual, on psychological processes and psychopathology. Uh, another side effect of uh, Generation 3 was that it eclipsed research on mediators and moderators. We no longer were allowed to study procrastination, self-criticism, unassertiveness, because these were not DSM diagnoses. On a positive note, uh, Generation 3 <coughs> improved the methodology. We needed to use real patients, not college students. The manuals had adherence checks and competency checks, and there were other methodological improvements to sharpen up our uh, internal validity. Another very important positive note is that clinical trials research demonstrated that psychosocial interventions can be equal to, and at, even at times, better than medications. So many people were not too happy about Generation 3 and the treatment of DSM diagnoses. And one of them was uh, Thomas Insel, who became head of the NIMH in 2002. And his problems with clinical trials is that it did not allow us to develop more effective medications. And it was through his directorship that the shift in priorities to RDOC took place. Now, this was a radical extension of Generation 3 in that it moved even further toward the medical model of psychological disorders. It represented uh, the need for studying basic psychological processes, which was certainly important, namely um, the negative and positive valence systems, such as um, how much self-criticism may be existing in a certain type of psychological problem, or the absence of positive self-reinforcement, or the nature of cognitive systems and, and their uh, distortions. Um, so around 2012, the RDOC was put forth as the priority for NIMH funding for psychological disorders. I'd like to turn now to some of the implications of RDOC, the research domain criteria, uh, for the development of psychoactive drugs. So after about 30 years or so of clinical trials that focused on DSM disorders, it was realized that this was not going to be an approach that could be helpful in the development of new psychoactive drugs. Uh, the structure of DSM provides little, if any, information about the interaction between uh, Axis 1 and Axis 2. Uh, and uh, as any clinician knows, the symptomatology that is manifested in any given case is very much related to the psychological processes of the patient. Um, so where our doc comes in is it is interested in looking at the biological underpinnings of these psychological processes. Uh, and it's um, looking within each of the different RDOC domains. 
we know that drug development is very expensive. Uh, they also make lots of money once they get a decent drug out on the market. Uh, in the past, they could always cherry pick their findings, reporting uh, only those uh, findings that seem to support the uh, efficacy of the new drug in question. However, with the need for transparency now, indeed the requirement for transparency, um, so both psychiatry and pharmaceutical houses are concerned about the need to develop improved drugs. Uh, for psychiatry, the concern is professional, and for pharmaceutical houses, it is financial. And the reason for this concern is that research is beginning to show that for certain kinds of clinical problems, such as mild or moderate depression, uh, medication doesn't seem to beat um, other interventions, such as psychosocial interventions and even placebos. Indeed, research findings continue to come out to indicate that for mild and moderate depression, uh, exercise can work just as effectively as medication. As a result, the pharmaceutical companies have stopped developing new psychoactive drugs. What is needed from their point of view is the translation of basic research on neuroscience and genetics. It sounds like we are rediscovering extrapolation that occurred in generation two from basic research to, to the clinic. But it's different here in that when translational research is used, it fo it's focusing on a, the biological processes. The talk is, it's from bench to bedside, from the biological bench to the medical bedside. What is not typically known is that the notion of translational research came from a, a National Institute of Health initiative in 2011, uh, applying to all areas of medicine. The goal of which is, and I quote, the treatment and cure for disease, unquote. Now this has very much been Insel's message that psychological problems are diseases of, uh, of the brain. And he has gone on to say that the RDOC priority involves an important collaboration between universities, pharmaceutical houses, and biotech companies. As he put it, quote, it's providing exciting opportunities for drug discovery and development, end quote. So in essence, the primary goal of RDOC is to develop medication. Uh, and this is often not recognized even by people who are advocating uh, the merits of RDOC. Uh, and this is a, a problem for clinical psychology and, and indeed for psychologists of other orientations or of other uh, uh, areas within the field. Um, many of us have argued that it is limiting to treat individuals as if they were psychologically disembodied organisms that are uninfluenced by psychosocial variables. Moreover, there is an accumulating body of evidence that psychosocial treatment can itself produce changes in the brain. Regardless of whether the research associated with RDOC funding will be successful or not, there may be some serious consequences for the future training of clinical psychologists. So what are some of the implications of RDOC for clinical training? To address this question, we need to project consequences of the fact that funding for neuroscience research has indeed eclipsed therapy research. On the positive side of RDOC research, it is also looking at basic psychological processes, and this can have important implications for understanding human functioning and the change process. However, this can only happen within the context of RDOC-related grants.
with a primary goal, again, to repeat myself because it's important to underscore this, the primary goal is to uncover biological processes for all mental disorders. Knowing more about the brain is unquestion unquestionably a good thing, but not instead of furthering what we need to know about psychotherapy. Um, new medications for certain kinds of clinical problems, such as schizophrenia and autism, indeed are important, but again, not if the research replaces funding for psychosocial interventions. So we come to um, the implications for clinical training. We all know that within psychology departments, the trend has been toward neuroscience. Um, neuroscience brings in grant money. And at the top tier PhD programs, it is very important to show that your research can be funded. Indeed, the indirect cost or overhead that come with grants play a very important role in funding universities and psychology departments. However, what this does is it places the NIMH in a position of deciding for us what the focus of research in clinical psychology should be, and also eventually what our clinical curriculum should be. Because in order to provide expertise in neuroscience, changes in the already overburdened clinical curriculum are needed, and something will have to go. Um, over time, there is a danger that fewer faculty will be not only involved in psychotherapy research, but also in teaching. And this fits into a, an already existing trend where master's level professionals, social workers, uh, nurses, and others are beginning to do therapy uh, in the field. And some may argue that doing therapy is pretty easy. All you need to do is to follow the manual. I'd like to read a quote to describe this concern about whether PhD psychologists will be trained to trained to do therapy in the future. I quote, intense competition for curriculum time provides a situation in which there is a decrease in curriculum and supervisory time devoted for psychotherapy training. At the same time, there are fewer faculty to teach and supervise psychotherapy, unquote. Now, this is not a comment about clinical psychology, uh, but it was used to comment about the trend in psychiatry departments in the 1970s and 1980s, where they moved from psychosocial interventions to biological psychiatry. And we all know the level of therapy training that exists in psychiatry departments in this country, which is minimal, uh, if at all. Now, there may be a ray of hope. Um, many of us have been very concerned about this RDOC priority, and there has been pushback. And there have been some important, very recent developments. People like Bethany Teachman, Mitch Prinstein, Dean McKay, and others, including psychologists, at the NIMH have lobbied for greater funding for psychotherapy and psychotherapy-related research. Thomas Insel, as many of us know, has recently left the NIMH to go to Google, and he has been replaced by Joshua Gordon as head. And Gordon seems to be more responsive than Insel. I was recently in contact with a colleague at the NIMH, a psychologist that I know, who said that strict RDOC priority may be beginning to change. And he mentioned that this is a somewhat challenging but exciting time for psychotherapy research. In a follow-up email 
he went on to say, and I quote him, I think that there are opportunities to translate basic science findings into new targets and strategies for psychosocial interventions. Also opportunities to refine and optimize our existing evidence-based interventions to improve their potency and effectiveness. And finally, opportunities to study ways of how to disseminate and implement our research-supported psychosocial interventions. So in essence, there are <clears throat> three areas of research that are going to be funded that do not involve the RDOC priority. Uh, the first is basic research on psychological processes. And this is very much like the notion of extrapolating from basic research to the clinic that existed uh, in generation two. Uh, and uh, physiological variables do not necessarily have to play a role in these applications. The second is outcome research that can improve existing psychosocial interventions. Uh, and this will involve looking at mediators and moderators. Uh, so again, like generation two, the interest here is not only in the outcome, but also in the process of change. And the third area is research on how to disseminate evidence-based uh, interventions so that uh, they can uh, be used by professionals in the field. The, um, in, in talking to this staff member at the NIMH, um, he emphasized that it's very important for people applying for grants uh, to consult with staff members beforehand uh, so that they can position and the focus of the grant in a way that increases the likelihood of, uh, of funding. They indeed, many of the staff members at the NIMH indeed would like to see this research done. So uh, here are some uh, links uh, that can give you descriptions of the RFAs uh, in the various uh, uh, areas uh, that will be funded. The interesting thing is that the NIMH now is talking about mediators and moderators. And again, shades of generation two. I think there's the realization, and from my point of view, at long last, a realization, that the clinical trials model with DSM disorders was not going to yield as much as we had hoped and that basic processes and target behaviors, and again, they're using the term targets of change, uh, are really the direction that we need uh, to go in, uh, and also the mechanisms uh, of change. Now, who will review these grants and how much funding will be allocated remains to be seen. Um, still, I have concerns, even though this is a ray of hope, I have concerns. The NIMH is run by biological psychiatrists. They call the shots. And the practice of psychiatry in the 21st century is based on the use of effective medications. And drug development is essential, uh, not only to them, but to pharmaceutical houses as well, very clearly. And psychosocial interventions continue to be secondary psychosocial interventions are referred to within the NIMH as, quote, non-pharmaceutical interventions for mental disorders, close quote. Still, this is a ray of hope. So if you're interested in a fuller discussion and documentation of some of the points that I've made uh, during this talk, I'd be happy to send you any PDFs um, which I made use of uh, in preparing my comments. Uh, and I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>